Judith enjoys playing with the idea of animals in the way that the great religions have done, not being anthropomorphic, but using them as substitutes for an unknowable something, something that she's trying to pin down, allowing an animal all its own ramifications, yet making it stand for something else she cannot explain or apprehend. Metaphors she is grasping at, in the sense that Claude Levi Strauss meant when he said that animals for early man were not only good to eat, they were good to think with. Snakes, like hyenas, have had a bad press. Her wish is to redeem the image that has been sullied by mythology. Their fine sinuous line and repetitive scale pattern also lends to graphic representation. When I was a student, I used to imagine pictures and try and complete them in my mind. And by the time I actually sat down to do the work. I was virtually copying a finished picture that was in my head, the same as I, way as I could copy a postcard, and the results tended to be very dead. So what happens now is I usually have an idea and um, then try to keep uh, myself from exploring um, the picture or the idea until I'm in front of a canvas and can do blow by blow on the canvas itself. Having been brought up as an atheist and subsequently converted to Catholicism, Judith considers herself to be philosophically agnostic, but an emotional believer. For a long time, um, I was very interested in and very committed to Orthodox Christianity. Um, I was brought up an atheist, and I think that converting to a, an Orthodox religion with such an enormous background of uh, works of art of every kind and such an incredible dense strength of justification for all its viewpoints was a very, very necessary and fine education. Uh, the um, crucifixion, I think, even if I hadn't converted uh, and to a great extent deconverted subsequently, um, would still have remained a very, very um, affecting image, um, partly because it's a victim that isn't an abused victim in the final sense. Um, there's a, um, a quality of gift and participation about even that sort of open-handed stance, which uh, I find very moving indeed. I think I would find it very moving if I were an Orthodox Hindu and uh, saw the symbol. I'd, I'd accept it for a whole lot of human reasons, even if I wasn't able to accommodate the divine reasons. A sop of vinegar, a midden of wasted human beings, an attempt to describe a Roman rubbish dump, the implication being that people are disposable rubbish, whether it be in ancient Rome or any modern city of conflict. In crucifixion, death has a gesture of defenselessness and blessing. In this painting of the scarecrow, the gesture is one of pathos, a stick-like starved creature, a half-mensch, neither menacing nor judging, appearing like a crucifix, protecting the elect, a scaring image nonetheless, on which to pin either ribbons and colors of pageantry or sackcloth and rags. Metaphorically, it is a small leap from the victim with open dance-like gestures to a scaring death set thing, the Christ. Shiva, a tapestry in which is woven the unearthly dance of Shiva, an image of the creator destroyer and the tension between dance and destruction juggling life and death, represented by the reaping sickle and death's noose.
Although she has examined most of the world's religions, the symbols of Christianity are ever present in her work. Um, the cross, uh, just as an abstract form, has a terrific tension across the canvas, which I find very exciting to work with. And um, uh, the extreme ectomorphic nature of a starved or um, ascetic body I have always found very beautiful indeed. It's one of the things that makes one very, very vulnerable to the beauty of some particularly horrid images such as those um, photographed at Auschwitz at the end of the Second War where people were pared down just to the bone. And um, the images are those of horror, but the bones actually have a, um, a beauty um, that doesn't compensate in any way, but is nevertheless recognizable. It makes very good graphics, even if it makes very, very terrible history. Painting is trying to make explicit what cannot be seen in any other way. More than once, Judith has returned to India, to the Himalayas. On this canvas, she has pressed her air ballooning suit against a skyline of mountains, impressions of the Himalayas recorded by the psychic camera buried deep in the recesses of her mind. Himalayan artifacts hang on her walls as reminders, waiting until she can return again. Judith has a penetratingly perceptive mind. Life's exploration is a search, a tome of inquiry. For all that, there is a tendency to set her apart from the ordinary and to regard her with awe. Art historian Esme Berman has expressed that it is this quality that has denied her the very humanity which is her greatest strength. Although she has confronted the challenge of interpreting mythological profundities, she has done so as a vital and vulnerable human being. Her joy and wit hide a self-deprecated image. She entertains and shares her life and knowledge with an abundance of humor and generosity. But always, quietly, subtly, the mind probes for answers. Her fingertips are tuned to the pain that has become life and the joy that is creation. When she married Bruce, she wrote, it is as if I've been quite happily standing upside down, facing the opposite direction. And you've righted me. And all this happiness goes on and on, day after day. I want to walk with you in marvelous places like the Himalayas, which help me redefine me to myself, as you have done. In the presence of mountains, Judith feels an awe, a fear, an exultation. As well as most South African mountains, she has climbed Kilimanjaro and the ruins Ori. The mountain is a central theme of strength, and of the ruthless isolation that prophets and seers tended to live in, in order to keep their capacity for prescience and insight at white heat. An isolation that she has emphatically expressed in her studies of Noah, not, as it is often told, as a nursery story, but of a man realistically fighting for survival in a drowning world. And John of Patmos, with files of universal solitude placed alongside his windowsill, looking out to a view of his revelation. Albert Camus wrote, I know with certainty that a man's worth is nothing but the long journey to recover through the detours of art, the two or three simple and great images which first gained access to his heart. <laughs> 